Well, my name is Vivian Howard. I'm a professor of bioimaging at the University of Ulster. Um, I'm a medically qualified pathologist and um, I specialise in the toxicology of the fetus and the infant. And um, as a toxicopathologist, I study the influence of um, toxins, which are chemicals usually, um, on the pathological processes that can be produced by exposure to them. When and why did you become interested in fluoride as a potential hazardous toxin? Well, when I look at the effect of environmental toxins, I nearly always do that through the prism of, of thinking about what we were exposed to during our evolutionary history, which goes back millions of years. And um, the fact is that geochemists can tell us that fluoride levels on the planet before the Industrial Revolution um, were very low. And that combined with something else, a um, piece of research by Professor Ekstrand in Stockholm, um, a number of decades ago now, who exposed lactating women um, to fluoride. And he measured the amount of fluoride that came out in the urine, and he measured the levels of fluoride in the blood, and he also measured the levels of fluoride in the breast milk. And although the serum levels in the blood went up, as you'd expect, and the urinary levels went up as it was excreted, the levels in the breast milk remained low. And my opinion is that that's an evolutionary mechanism that's developed to keep fluoride away from the baby. And we know as developmental toxicologists that during your exposure to things as a baby, you're much more vulnerable to damage than you would be as an adult. For some chemicals, maybe a thousand times uh, higher vulnerability. So fluoride is administered through the public water's water supply in order to protect people's teeth. Um, it's widely accepted that fluoride does have a positive effect on the surface of the tooth, um, so if it's applied topically. Um, However, we're being asked to consume it, to drink it, and internalize it into our bodies. Now, the problem is that fluoride accumulates in the body over a lifetime. It's the lifetime dosage which actually is the important factor. Um, it gets laid down in tissues other than the teeth. So any hard tissue will accumulate uh, fluoride. Now, it, it comes in nature, it tends to come to us as calcium fluoride, and that's a very insoluble form of fluoride, and it's been shown that that doesn't bioaccumulate to anything like the extent of sodium fluoride, which is what you find in toothpaste, or hexafluorosilicic acid, this waste byproduct that's added to the water supply. Um, it, it's been estimated in studies that about half of what you take in of those compounds stays in the body. And um, that can have effects on the structure of bones, or to be related to osteoporosis and bone fractures later in life. But it doesn't only accumulate in bone, it's probably been taken into other tissues as well. Um, I for, can't understand because fluoride is abundantly available now in tablets, in dentifrices, in dental treatments, um, why it is considered necessary to get a whole population to drink it. It, it doesn't make any sense. And um, I think also it's uh, administering a compound as a medicine without informed consent. Can you tell us, Vivian, what is the precautionary principle that you refer to in your work with respect to fluoride, of course? Well, the precautionary principle is a, it's a tool for decision makers to decide at any particular point in a process whether the risks and the benefits having been weighed up, whether it is worthwhile going 
and taking the next step or not. So now we're, we're, we have a decision whether to continue fluoridating or to stop. Let's assume that the people who introduced this nearly 50 years ago um, were beneficent and making the decision um, for the best of reasons to try and protect public health. I mean, I think that's the case, actually. Well, now I think there's, there's so much evidence on the table to suggest that it's not a good idea. I mean, there's fluorosis of the teeth, fluorosis of the bones, this um, work on cancer, osteosarcoma of the bone uh, in teenage kids, um, and there's these studies on IQ. Now, you know, on a, on a public health basis, if you actually move the average IQ spectrum five points lower, so the average is 100 in an IQ distribution, you move it down to 95. Actually, what that means is that you've just doubled the number of people with an IQ less than 70. And you've halved the, 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 the number of people in the population with an IQ over 130, who are the people you really need to help you run your society. So, although it maybe doesn't sound an awful lot, it, it, it's enormous on a, on a sort of societal basis. The thing is, if you, didn't, if you stop fluoridating water tomorrow, nobody would die. Nobody would be an acute problem. Um, and there's plenty of options for applying fluoride topically to the teeth. And um, I think that, in my opinion, having read the literature extensively, I think uh, the case for applying the precautionary principle and stopping this um, activity, which is something which I think is long past its sell-by date, um, uh, that is what we should do. Because actually the people who introduced it are no longer here to feel hubris or uh, that they've been badly done by. Uh, and this is just taking a pragmatic decision um, based on current evidence and the, the evidence is accumulating.